Can you please introduce yourself? Yes, my name is Sue Evans. Um, married now and living in Bex Hill. When I worked at Alders, my surname would have been Fernando. Mm -hmm. My dad was Sri Lankan, my mother from Croydon. Mm. <laughs> and what about your early life? Just, just Croydon. Um, we didn't tend to move much. I don't think my mum and dad had an awful lot of money. Um, my mum worked for Alders, so she got me started in Alders as a Saturday girl. Mm. I have two brothers, twin brothers, so if we wanted to earn a bit of pocket money, we would come in into the offices and maybe count the money or do some menial stamping task, something like that, just for pocket money. So Alders is always... I don't remember not having an Alders in my life whether it was through mum working there or us working there. So. so I don't really remember her telling me much. I mean, I know who she worked for, who she worked with. Um, there would be big Christmas parties and social events, so she would say what that was like when she came home. Um, I remember one year, we would only have been quite small, I remember one year she went to one of the Christmas parties and it's the sort of thing mums do. There were little cocktail umbrellas in the drinks and she thought, oh, I'll take them for the children. And she put them in her handbag. When she got home, she discovered she'd put them in somebody else's handbag. <laughs> so it, it was little things like that that probably came in when I was too young to, to go there to work. And how old were you when you started there? Well, I started as a Saturday girl, so I think probably about 15, 16, mm. officially. Although we were going in before, mm -hmm. you know, if they needed a little extra help at Christmas, at sale time, we'd go in and do a bit of counting money or... I think we did a lot of stamping. I, don't, I can't remember what we were stamping, but very simple jobs that... It was quick and easy and we'd get a few pounds for it, you know, maybe a couple of pounds. So mm -hmm. that's my first introduction to orders. And I think I remember, although I have spoken to another lady that worked there, Christmas parties for children. But she didn't have children and couldn't remember that. So I'm, I may be imagining it. <laughs> and of course, Father Christmas, seeing Father Christmas at Alders, they always had a very good grotto. Um, and so we'd always go there for that. So that would be probably my earliest memory. And that would have been, I don't know, five or six, maybe. Can you describe the atmosphere when you went there? What, to the grotto? Yeah. Oh, one year they had the most fantastic grotto. You had to go through the toy department, mm -hmm. which was always very exciting anyway, especially near Christmas. And you went into a room, and I don't know how they did it. They, you sat on little benches... And obviously there was a, uh, some sort of screened picture going by you and you were supposed to be on a swan. So you sat in what was like a little swan with the, little, with the big swan head at the front and you felt that you were moving because you were almost on like roller. I don't know how they did it, but it was fascinating. And you were convinced you were floating down a river. So you came in one door at the back and you went out the other door at the front and there was Father Christmas. Mm. So it was, it was beautifully done. And the window displays were very good then. But yeah, that would be my earliest memories, I would think. It was a great place to work. Um, a good place to go and buy things too, because they would have a lot of choice. And yeah, I think it, for me, it was just a, a lovely place. I mean, I didn't really ever go anywhere else. I would never really go to Debenhams or Grants, or because all just with mum working there and blah, blah, mm. was the f place to go, really, for us. Mm. So in which department did you work between then and before and stuff here? Actually, I've, I figured out I started earlier. Mm -hmm. In 1972, I went in as a Saturday girl, and I went into the cash office, which is where you deal, obviously, with cash. And then when I sort of gone on a bit. Then I went into the tube room, which was a part of the cash office, but a little separate. And of course that was for the lamps and paragon tubes, the vacuum tubes, where the money shot through the store. 
when I was little and used to go in with mum maybe, I used to call it the dustbin room. Yeah. Because the noise was like when the dustbin men used to come to empty the bins. Mm. That clanking, whooshing sound. And I absolutely loved it. It was fascinating. Because you'd be sitting in a small room. I think there were six chairs, but very often there weren't six people. And the tubes would crash down onto a conveyor belt and you'd open them up quickly, deal with whatever needed to be done. It was from places in the store that did not have tills usually, because not every cash desk had a till, because you'd have needed hundreds of them. Mm. Um, and you'd give change or you'd stamp a receipt if they were paying for HP, twist it up, find the tube to go back to the correct till, open it, whack it in, bang it up, and off it would go. <laughs> and it, w it would be on a busy day, non-stop. It was a company called Lampson, Lampson Paragon. They invented a pneumatic system where metal tubes about this side yeah. with rubber bumpers, as the best way to describe it, would travel through vacuum tubes. Mm. Um, through, I mean, it must have taken ages to put in all these pipes everywhere. Um, I can't remember if there was a tube up and a tube down if you were in the store. I can't remember if it worked that way or the vacuum made the tube go whichever way you... I'm not sure how that worked. I've got a feeling it was one way in and another one out. Um, but it was fascinating. It was really interesting. And at Christmas time or at sale time, you couldn't work fast enough. You would be sitting in money. You'd be walking across money to go out for lunch or a tea break. There was so much money, you, you, you're literally throwing it into waste paper bins to deal with later. It, it was an amazing thing to see. And obviously they could only have people they trusted working in there because it would have been so easy to just pick up this money and walk off with it. But I loved it. It was amazing. The funniest part was when sometimes a tube would come up and then you had so much to do, you'd get another tube saying, I'm still waiting for my tube. <laughs> you know, oh, no. Or you'd send it down and you'd send it accidentally to the wrong place and they'd have to, it was it was funny, really funny. Or occasionally there'd be some sort of blockage. I don't know how that would be caused. Maybe two tubes, to, to, I, oh, I really don't know. And that would be real chaos because it was, it was important for them to get the money off the shop floor. But yeah, it was, I loved it, absolutely loved it. That was my favourite place. <laughs> You'd be sitting in a small room with your back to other people, women. I don't remember any men working in there. And there'd be a tiny desk about this wide. Um, you'd have a, a cabinet beside you with change in, with a stamp to say you've been authorised if it was a, some sort of receipt they needed. In front of you would be a whole bank of pipes that come down, like organ pipes, come down like that with a little shutter on the end and you'd hear it, you could hear them coming. You'd hear clang, 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 bang as it hit the thing in front of you. You'd pick it up, take it out, deal with whatever needed doing, usually change. Or sometimes they were just sending the money up and you kept it. So you'd authorise it, yes, I've got it. They, it was all done on um, carbon paper. Yeah. So you'd have a three-part bill which they'd send up. So you'd sign it to say you had it. We'd keep one piece. The other two pieces would go back down to the till. One for the customer, one for the shop floor. Fabulous. And how was the relationship between you and the asset? I'm just imagining you come there as a young girl, Saturday girl, you said. Mm. And then there were just elderly women there. How was the relationship? Oh, they were very motherly, really. And plus they, they, they knew my mum. And very often their children would come in if, you know, yeah. it was, it's the sort of thing that happened, yeah. So no, it was, it was really very nice. I, there were very few men working in there. Mm. I mean, I remember one or two, namely the managers of the thing, mm. but not actually doing the, the work. Mm. And were you trained on a job or yeah. you had a bit little introduction period? training or something? Trained on the job, really. It, it, to be honest, it wasn't rocket science. Mm. 
it was just giving change and stamping things in the tube room. It wasn't difficult. It was, you had to pay attention because if you sent the tube to the wrong place and you were sending money back, change back, you didn't know who was going to get it the other side. And um, once you'd sent it through, you really might not remember where it was going. You had no idea if you sent it down the wrong tube mm. where it would end up. Because <laughs> they weren't labelled menswear, toys, whatever. They had numbers, I seem to remember. Mm. So it would have been very easy to make a mistake. And you only worked in this department or did you work in no. other places? No. Then, of course, this was just for a Saturday. Then, of course, I went back to school to do A-levels. Um, I started on the Monday. Thursday, I came home and said, I don't want to do A-levels. I want to go and earn some money. So my mother said, right, old as it is then. And I had to then go for a proper interview. And then I got a job in Bort, touched it, Bort Ledger, which is dealing with the invoices which is where we, the thing that horrified me more than anything was we used to buy wedding dresses mm -hmm. from Pronuptia and all the other places. And I would see how much we paid for the wedding dress. Mm -hmm. And I could then see how much we were selling this wedding dress for. So yeah, we dealt with invoices from mm -hmm. our suppliers. It was, that was another interesting job, a bit more involved. And I think I was there full time for approximately three years and that was it then I left orders completely. Mm. And can you describe the atmosphere in this new job? New job. I think with orders part of the fun was the characters. There were so many different different people and I'm not going to mention his name but the boss of our department at the time he was a very nice man but he did nothing. And I seriously mean he did nothing. He would want, mind you, we used to do it. I have to admit, if we wanted a five minute, well, half an hour break, we would pick up a piece of paper and say, I'm just going down to menswear. And you'd go down to pretend you're going to menswear to the offices there, because they each individual department had their own office to ask a question about an invoice. And you could wander off around the store looking at the new clothing coming in and the makeup. But this boss, that was his working life. He would just wander about the store, making friends with all the managers and the people in the store. He was eventually found out and got rid of, though. But <laughs> he, he had a very nice working life, put it that way. But it, it was fun because there were so many characters. Um, It's difficult to, to express it, really. There were characters in working there and, of course, customers. You can get some very odd customers. Not that in the office we were aware of them all the time. We were more aware of the different staff. Mm. But when I first went there, it was very different because it was a hangover from the old days. All the women were called Miss, regardless of whether they were married or not. It was always Miss so-and-so, Miss so-and-so. And the managers and buyers treated very well. They had a separate restaurant with waitress service mm -hmm. that we were not allowed to go into. So my mum would be off having waitress served lunch while the rest of us were queuing up in the canteen. Um, but they did stop that after a while. Um, but it, you, there were hierarchies within the store, I think. The buyers were always very well thought of because they had a lot of power. Mm. They had buying power. They would choose what was going to be sold in the store. The managers had power. And the girls in perfumery had power. Mm. They were so beautiful, beautifully made up. They were often um, employed by the uh, makeup company, by mm. Estee Lauder or whoever. So they'd have a, a nice uniform. But you, you just knew where they worked when they wafted up to the canteen. <laughs> so even in, there was like a class system, if you like, within the store. I don't know, I imagine that eventually stopped because the managers lost their private canteen and everything became a bit more democratic, I think. 
Yeah, because I, if you get very clever, you can pretend you're going to query an invoice. Um, was it strict? I imagine it was stricter on the shop floor. You had to stand by a till, you had to serve mm -hmm. customers. I was trying to remember if they had a staff uniform, and I don't remember. I can't remember it. I think they tried to introduce one, but of course that didn't apply to us. Um, but the thing is, you just didn't really mess around. You there and did your job. You didn't. We had some very funny instances. We had an awful lot of temps. And we used to have a beautiful delicatessen in the basement called Cullen's. Big famous brand. It no longer exists. But you could get alcohol. And we had an Australian temp who would come with one of the big cups. And we assumed it was water. But he was drinking alcohol all day. And he would just get more and more drunk and more and more silly. But you, no one ever seemed to do anything about these things. Because being a temp, you just said, well, we'll have a different one next week. Thank you. <laughs> so life, I think working life was, was fun then. It was different. You haven't got the stresses you have now. As long as you did your job, people didn't really... And I think we had much more of a work ethic and we didn't have to be told you need to be here at nine you need to do your job you, you can I can't go until five we just did it i tried to persuade my immediate boss to come here and talk to you because she started in 1956 with her sister and she's still she's amazing she's still climbing trees to prune them <laughs> i know i know but she didn't want to be recorded but I have spoken to her, but uh, she remembers starting and how they came for interviews, her and her twin sister, they came along and they had pink cardigans that their mother had brought them new and they were told, yes, you have the job, but you can't come in a pink cardigan, it's too bright. And she, They were only working in the offices, so um, they had to be bought grey cardigans for work. Um, and she remembers Miss, you always call someone Miss and your boss Mister. But also there were um, nicknames. My mum was Mrs Fernando, or Miss Fernando, they probably called her. But they never called her that, they called her Ferdy. Oh, okay. So when I started, I was little Ferdy. Um, so everybody had little nicknames. And I remember, but I, I hope this is true, I hope this is true. We had a store detective called Mrs Ardley. And she was an ex-prison warden who'd come from, I'm not sure which one, but she was reputed to have been the prison warden with Ruth Ellis the night before she was hung. And she was amazing because she was a big, big woman. And she'd always wear what we call outdoor clothes. So she wasn't wearing uniform or anything. She'd have to put a coat on. She'd wander around the store and she very often just leapt on shoplifters. There's no two ways about it. She wouldn't try and take them gently by the arm and apprehend them. She would literally jump on them. It, it was, a, but this is what I mean. It, it's the, it was the characters, and of course these rumours will go out. <laughs> Guess what she's done today? Guess who she jumped on today? So it, it was like family, really. I think that's that's the only way I can describe it. So what was? Your relationship with the buyers? Um, purely to, to process the paperwork, really. Process the invoices. Um, they would organise buying stuff in and then we would organise the payment of those invoices. So basically you needed to check that this stock had actually arrived, was correct, they were happy with it, and then we would pay the invoice. Do you remember what kind of companies uh, you got your goods from? Oh, goodness, all over. Um, so many. Um, because at Bought Ledger, you dealt with invoices for the whole store. So it was everything from, I don't know, can't think of a Westinghouse cookers to people that selling bathrooms to, I mean, orders literally. I can't think what they didn't sell, to be honest. And at one time, they try, even tried a pet department mm. because my brother's, started to work on Saturday in orders too, being a family, family thing. And one of their girlfriends, who became their wife, worked in the pet department. 
and my mum walked through one day and came home with two gerbils, which then turned out to be about 30 gerbils. Mm. But so, yeah, they tried a pet department. I don't think it was particularly successful. So the suppliers, um, Pronuptia for wedding dresses, Wedgwood for china, mm. curtains would have come from all over. I can't think of a curtain company. Vantona is the name. That I, we had Noritaki china, and of course that comes from Sri Lanka. We had um, beautiful china department mm. with lovely ornaments. We had Royal Copenhagen ornaments and um, all sorts of things. Bang & Olufsen, the stereos, mm. the TVs. All sorts of all sorts of things. Mm. We had bedding departments, which wasn't just bedding, duvets, mm. pillows. It was the actual bed. Um, we really used to sell yeah. so much. And then there was the wonderful bargain basement. I don't know if uh, if anyone's mentioned the bargain basement. They tried that for a short time. Um, that was literally in the basement. And that was selling very cheap things. Um, bulk buying lots of cheap things and trying to sell them cheaply. I'm trying to think what else they tried that didn't work. Well, there was a hairdressing department. They also, at one time, I'm not sure why or how, took in the breast screening department for Mayday Hospital. So we actually had breast screens in there. Actually, I think people probably thought, oh, that's nice. Mm. Because it was, I mean, Alders was Croydon. Yeah. If you were coming to Croydon, you were usually coming to Alders. Um, it's such a shame now. It's well, it's unbelievable that it's gone, really. But it's, I, I'm trying to think what the demise was. I presume probably the internet, and they had a lot of competition from Debenhams and Grants, and the, I wouldn't say Alders were the cheapest, but the quality was very good. Um, and also, of course, orders, you had orders in Bromley and, well, there were so many because orders then became part of the UDS group. And I remember also they had a, a home for retired members of staff in Mill Hill somewhere because they offered my mum a little place. It was like arms houses, mm. but we were quite young and we said, no, no, you can't go. So she didn't take them up on it. So they, they actually did really care for their staff, I think. It's certainly in the old days. And what was the reason you left eventually? After five well, years or four years? Well, six years, if you count Saturday, go, I've mm. been there six years. I think because I worked in the offices. My mum worked in the, the next... She stopped being the head of cash office. She became the manager of the pensions. And... Um, I think I just wanted to move away from my mum, really, to try and do it on my own and just have a change. And I think if you worked in orders, most of those people worked there their whole working life. And I just thought, I don't really want to do this. So I decided to go elsewhere. I went to work for Phillips. Do you know the big Phillips oh. building down there? And then I became a civil servant. <laughs> but, yeah. So uh, in Luna House, so I worked for, mm. for the, with the asylum seekers in Luna House. And mm. then we decided to move out of Croydon and I stopped work. We've been away from Croydon now for 12 years. Uh, um, so I, the only, and I've actually, this is the first time I've come back in 12 years. I've had no wow. reason, I've had no, re I've been to the outskirts. I've had no reason to come into the middle. So. Uh, I can't believe the change. It's incredible. Mm. So I've only heard the demise of orders second hand. Um, my husband comes up and stays in Croydon and travels to London. Um, and he has come back with tales of, oh my goodness, you should see orders now. Um, I, fa I haven't made it there, but I will mm. go there and have a quick look before yeah, I go home. Um, when I left, it was starting to get a bit run down I think is the only way to describe it um, because I can imagine the upkeep of that huge store must have been immense absolutely immense um, and it became I think like most of the stores are now a showroom you couldn't go in and say well I'll have that table those chairs right you've got to wait six to eight weeks for that you know when the old days I think you could go in and say can I have mm. and they we used to have a 
like a maintenance place and probably storerooms elsewhere. So it wasn't quite as it is now. Mm. You were just talking about Groydon at the time. Just imagine when you exit, when you came out of your, from your workplace. How did Groydon look like, the, the inner, inner part of Groydon? Busy, absolutely busy. Mm. It was lovely. Um, Croydon was a lovely market town. It had good schools, it was surrounded by greenery, there were a lot of parks. Croydon, the centre of Croydon was shopping and commerce only. Mm. Nobody lived in Croydon and I, I understand now you've got big blocks of flats and you would never see, the only supermarket we had in Croydon was Sainsbury's in the Wycliffe Centre. Mm. These other su supermarkets that I've passed on the way from the station are here because people are living here. So Croydon has changed. You always had restaurants, mostly South Croydon, mm. and we had the cinema at Broad Green, which now it's over there, and obviously the Fairfield Halls were a good draw, but it's very, very different. And Croydon, you'd come out after work, queuing for the, we would go home by bus, now I'd probably take the tram, um, queue for the bus, and you'd cram onto the bus, and it was just busy, 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 busy. They did have social events, years ago but that kind of stopped um i don't think they really did any social events i mean they used to do parties at christmas and they'd do day trips out to margate or wherever but that didn't that, that didn't happen there was a social secretary but i didn't join in presumably because i was so much younger mm. i'm sure my mum went to things in fact i do remember her going to things but for me as a teenager they weren't for me so um, I went to Philips Lighting. Well, actually, I went to a small firm that was part of Philips Lighting. Then I ended up at City House after working in London for Philips. And then when I had um, our daughter, I wanted to go part-time. And they don't employ many part-time managers at Philips. Mm. So I left and joined the NHS as a clinic manager. I did that for a couple of years. That wasn't the greatest job. Mm. And then um, I worked for the civil service mm. and worked part-time at Luna House, mm. which was very oh, stressful. Um, so I worked it for the civil service um, in, they do love their acronyms, ASU, which was the asylum seekers unit, um, which would be interviewing asylum seekers, which I absolutely loved. I loved it because, again, I think I like dealing with people. Um, it was an eye-opener, it, but it was fascinating. And then I moved from there to work in Electric House, which I don't know whether that even is still there now, on the corner. And that was for still for the civil service, but dealing with foreign national prisoners. And that was very stressful. And then around that time, my mum died, and I think I c couldn't deal with the stress of the stressful job, my mum dying. Um, so I stopped work <laughs> and I haven't worked since, lucky me. Mm. It's a beautiful building. I mean, I don't know whether they've gutted the inside. There were some areas that were genuinely old, but it's huge. And I can't imagine it's suitable for anything other than a shop, mm. unless a lot of money spent on it, or maybe some sort of arts centre. But you have the Fairfield Halls, you have here, you have the clock tower. I'm not sure you need another one. Um, I don't know, because it is so big. Mm. 